Okay, so 2025 is here and you're looking to buy a new MacBook. You might have already watched some other reviews which went really deep into the specs and comparisons but left you even more confused with lots of pros and cons and it's possible you still haven't arrived at a decision. Plus, you might have heard that the M4 MacBook Air will be out soon so should you just screw all of these and wait for that? Well, then this video might be the right one for you because instead of just throwing technical specifications and jargon at you, I'll do my best to tell you what they mean for you and your hard-earned money. And this is important because some of the stuff I found about these MacBooks is not what you would expect. You might even call it counterintuitive. For example, the M3 MacBook Air, which is the latest and greatest, should be an easy recommendation, right? Now, I know this sounds crazy, but for most people, I think the answer is no. I don't think I can recommend it except in two very specific cases. Why? I'm glad you asked because now's the perfect time to get into the full review. Okay, quick summary to make all of this easy to digest. Apple currently sells two versions of their MacBook Air, the M3 and the M2. They don't officially sell the M1 version anymore, but it's still one of the best laptops you can buy and it's still available on third-party websites like Amazon. Apple is also expected to launch the M4 MacBook Air in early 2025 and best guess consensus is April to June 2025 maybe but I'll come back to that in a minute. Let's first talk about the two that they do sell today the M3 and the M2 and let me first tell you the big differences between these two laptops that you need to know. First there's obviously the processor the CPU chip is slightly upgraded in the M3 and the graphics processor is also slightly faster and it supports hardware accelerated ray tracing which can be quite useful for some of the really pro games. Second, the anodized coating on the midnight blue color which used to fingerprint like crazy has finally been improved. I'll tell you more about why this matters in a minute. Now third, there's also support for two 5K monitors with the lid closed versus just one that you got in the earlier M2. Fourth, the SSD hard drive has finally been improved or maybe I should say just restored back to the M1 which had two SSD chips so that the read and write speed of the hard drive wasn't super slow like it was on the M2. And fifth, it's priced at $1199 of pounds or euros or 1 lakh 15,000 rupees versus the M2 which has now dropped down to 100 less at $1099 of pounds or euros or 99,000 rupees. Now whilst we're talking price, the M1 isn't sold on Apple's website anymore but until stocks last, I'm seeing it at like four to $600 of pounds or 40, 50,000 rupees on sites like Amazon. And I think it's an absolute steal. So if you wanna look into that, Watch my full video review and I'll link it up here. Okay, but back to the M2 and M3. Given all of these things, do I recommend that you buy the M3 MacBook Air over the M2? Well, not really, except in two very specific cases. And let me explain why I say that. First, we need to talk about this M3 chip. It's obviously faster. Most benchmarks have put it about 20 to 22% faster than the M2. And this is not a new chip. We've seen this chip family already on the MacBook Pro and the iMac. Now, for most of us who do everyday computing tasks like apps, browsing, email, a bit of photo and video editing, you don't need an M3. You actually don't even need an M2. The M1 itself is more than enough to do all of this with ease. If I were you, I would downgrade on the chip and invest that extra cash to get more RAM or more storage, especially if you do editing. That'll be more valuable. And remember, for the few people watching who might actually want to get the full power of the M3 chip, they should instead look at the M3 MacBook Pro or even the M4 MacBook Pro, which has a cooling fan. Because without the fan, the M3 MacBook Air actually throttles the performance of the M3 chip so that it doesn't end up overheating, which is a total waste of the additional processing power you get in the M3. And that's why the M3 Air actually looks less impressive in tests with sustained workloads uh, like Cinebench. Now let's actually spend a minute on the graphics as well because the benchmarks show that they're four to 5% faster than the M2 and include hardware accelerated ray tracing, which isn't really applicable to anyone except for people who play really high-end games or do really high-end complex processing things like 3D modeling. Now, for any gamers watching, before you close this video saying, is this guy serious? Who games on the MacBook Air? I agree, I agree. All I'm saying is that compared to before, it does manage to run games that are made for Apple Silicon like Resident Evil 4 pretty well as long as you don't use the highest settings. So of course you're going to want to play it on a PlayStation, of course. No one who's serious about gaming plays Resident Evil on a MacBook Air, like no one. Okay, so the GPU is not a really big value add either. 
Look, I've said it before and I'll say it again. The chips that Apple makes nowadays are all so good that the new generation of chips are mostly a marketing gimmick. It's one that Apple uses to get people to pay to upgrade or pay more, especially on the MacBook Air. And it makes no perceptible difference in real life. And I want you to save your money and invest in features that actually matter. Just like I hope you invest in a small, hardworking creator like me by subscribing to the channel and liking the video and asking me questions or sharing your experience on the comments below. Okay, so next, let's talk about the improved anodized midnight blue coating, which I talk about in detail in my full review of the MacBook Air M2, and I'll leave a link up here below. Apple says that they upgraded it, but most reviewers who tested it say it's the same mostly, so it looks like someone at Apple again fluffed this up, and yet again, it's still fingerprints and smudges with ease, and the only difference seems to be you can rub it off a little bit more easily, but overall, my recommendation stays the same as before, as it did with the M2. Please. Don't buy this color unless you want to be stuck with a forever smudgy looking laptop. Okay, the third difference was that there's support for two 5K monitors, which is only useful if you use this setup at your desk with the lid closed. And yes, that's something the M2 and M1S can't do natively. But if you ask me, if you want to use this setup at home, then you can always buy a display link capable dock that allows you to connect two screens. So to me, this feature is useful, yes, but given most people buy a MacBook Air for its portability and use it with one monitor, it's probably not not the reason to upgrade for most people. Fourth, the SSD or the solid state hard drive speed has been improved over the M2, which is a welcome change, but this is not an upgrade. It's more of a fix to a problem that Apple created for no reason at all on the M2, because it worked fine on the M1. For context, the base model of last year's M2 MacBook Air only used one SSD module instead of the two that we saw on the M1, and the same two have been brought back on the M3. What this means for you is that on the M2, you get slower read and write speed on the hard disk. Now again, as I've shown in my full M2 MacBook Air review, this doesn't really make a perceptible difference for most people. Would you really notice the speed if I didn't tell you about it in this video? Probably not. And most of us work online nowadays or browse in the cloud anyway. So again, for most people, it's not reason enough to buy the M3. And for the people who actually move a lot of physical files around all day on their hard drive, like video editors, those guys would be looking at the MacBook Pro with fans to take advantage of the chip anyway. So I can't figure out who the use case really is for, for such a minute difference. It's good that Apple fixed it, but I can't justify telling you to spend 10% more for this feature alone. So let's step back. If you're wondering whether to buy the M3 MacBook Air, then ask yourself, who are you? One, if you're someone who does the everyday stuff, browsing, email, photo editing, even a light bit of video editing, running some basic code and other things, then honestly, you don't need an M3. You don't even need an M2. And even an M1 would work great if you can get it before stocks run out. And then you can use that money you saved to either spec up that laptop or buy a nice Apple Watch or a pair of AirPods to go with it, which are actually useful products. Now, at the time of making this video, the M1 MacBook Air was available for an insanely low price between 400 and 600 pounds or dollars at around 50,000 rupees on sites like Amazon. So if you're a casual everyday user, I would seriously still consider it. And if you want me to go into detail, I'll link my full review on the M1 MacBook Air up here. But if you find that the M1 is no longer available on third-party sites, go ahead and get an M2. You'll absolutely love it. I've got one right here and it absolutely smashes any task I throw at it. But if you're someone who's a more pro user and wants to spec up their laptop for long-term use as a developer or a serious editor, I think that you still shouldn't get the M3. You should rather buy an M2 and spec it up with more RAM and storage, which will serve you better than an M3 with lower specs. And this is because the processor bump on the M3 is really minor. Better yet, wait for the M4, which comes later this year. That's supposed to have a very meaningful processor bump. And if you're a really serious developer or editor, look at the MacBook Pro over the air anyway. So the only reason to really buy the M3 is if you specifically want to be able to use two monitors straight out of your laptop or you want to use the ray tracing feature for gaming. And the last reason to get the M3 over the M2 would be the speed of data transfer on the SSD, given the issue I talked about earlier. So yes, if your work involves moving around large local files and transferring them around on your laptop and between a laptop and a thumb drive, which again in today's day isn't for most people, but if that is you, you can consider the M3 Air. But I don't think that there's gonna be a lot of you with that use case. So basically, I guess what I'm saying is that the M3 MacBook Air is almost for no one. And to be clear, this 
this is not a bad thing. It's a great thing for consumers. Apple has raised the bar like crazy with its own chips. They've become so good that even they are struggling to find improvements that are truly meaningful to people. Okay, and before I go, if you still decide to buy the M3 after all of this and you don't mind spending the extra money and specking it up, then I have one question for you. Do you really need it now or can you wait? Because as soon as Apple launches the M4 between April to June in 2025, the M3 is going to drop in price and then you can either buy the latest M4 with a great new processor and features, which will be even sweeter if they bring in some of the features from the M4 MacBook Pro like that incredible nano texture display or the center stage cam. Or you can just save money on the same M3 and buy it at a lower price. Regardless of what you choose, I have a review for each laptop that I highly recommend you go through in detail before you actually buy it because the M2 has specific models that don't make sense, the M1 has a color that's better and so on. So don't go throwing your money before you go through all of the details. I'll leave all of the links up here and down below. I hope this was useful. Do leave comments below and let me know what you thought and see you on the next one.